Here's your chair. All right, well, welcome everybody. It's, uh, it's exciting to see you, and uh, we're so glad you're joining us for our Thursday night Bible study this year. Uh, we chose the book of Mark. Yeah. And uh, we're going to dive in and, and uh, cover it all this year. So mm -hmm. uh, the Gospels are exciting. Uh, talking about Jesus is nothing better than that. And so we're super looking forward to it, I think. Uh, I'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, just uh, send your Holy Spirit to be with us. I pray that as we talk about your word and we, uh, we experience fully uh, your blessing, I, I just pray, Father, that you would lead and guide our conversation, that it would uh, be beneficial, not just to us, but to all those who watch. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So just for a heads up on our format, we decided to do teacher-student. That's our format. So I'll be the teacher today. Um, and uh, Jillian will be the student, but next time she'll be the teacher, I'll be the student. So it'll, it'll bounce around a little bit, but the idea is um, just to give the opportunity for some life to the conversation uh -huh. and, uh, and, and some interest. So we're just going to dive right in. We're beginning in the book of Mark, chapter 1. And before I begin reading, I, I thought I'd like to talk about authorship for a minute, mm. because uh, since we're talking about Mark, he's not as well known as, you know, Peter or or a Paul, or, or even Matthew, because right. he's the author. Um, I, generally, the, the author is not named in the book. He hasn't named himself. He doesn't say, I wrote this and my name is. Um, but we do have a uh, church historian in the early 2nd century, Papias. Sounds like a, a, sounds like a fruit. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Papias uh, basically said that it was John Mark. Uh, it was Mark. Uh, John Mark was um, uh, the the uh, young person who's uh, had church events happening at his house, uh, his mom's house, actually. Um, he was also on Paul's first missionary journey. He was a cousin to Barnabas. Um, he also was with Peter in uh, Rome, or it says Babylon in the Bible, but uh, probably... That was code for uh, Rome. Mm. And uh, lastly, he was most likely the young guy who ran away naked uh, right. when Jesus was uh, taken from the, <laughs> from the garden. So, you know, an interesting character, yes. not a main character, right. but he had enough bit parts that he really made a difference uh, and uh, was part of the original, uh, you know, the original story of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of cool. Yeah. But let's dive right in. We're going to begin with... Mark chapter 1, verse 1, and the Bible says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So right off the bat, I kind of get the feeling here that um, he is spelling out what he's about, and uh, he wants to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Now, I think in Mark's time, generally, gospel referred to the actual oral teaching of the good news about Jesus' death and resurrection, but... Over time, we kind of transitioned the word. Now we call the Gospels the four stories about Jesus' right. life. So that can be confusing to people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they hear the beginning of the Gospel, and they immediately think, you know, this is the beginning of the book of Mark. You know, that's right. the idea. But really, he's saying this is the beginning of the oral teaching about the good news of mm -hmm. Jesus's, you know, life, death, and resurrection. Why this is exciting. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, um, and you know, as we dive into this, Mark, I feel like it's super, like, uh, action-packed. He just wants to get into it. I, I kind of like Mark. I picked it. Just just saying. We said one of the four, but I went for Mark. I we didn't... do want you to do one of the four Gospels yeah. this year. He picked Mark. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's a favorite. We'll, we'll, oh. we'll get into more why, but uh, I like Mark. And then he, in verse 2, he goes right into it. He says, As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Mm -hmm. And John came baptizing in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Mm -hmm. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now, little known, uh, converts to Judaism generally were baptized. Mm -hmm. It was the 
a physical symbol that you were leaving your old life as a Gentile mm -hmm. and that you were joining the sect of Judaism. Right. But what is strange or is kind of a newer concept is now Jews are getting baptized, yes. which is a, kind of a stranger thought process, not for us today, but for them it would have been strange. It would have been an odd occurrence. Now the Esnes, I guess, it's one of those sects of Judaism, uh, sects the of Judaism, Essenes, 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 thank you, Essenes. yes, I'm pronouncing it wrong, All good. they did that stuff, but, um, but it would, they were a very small, eclectic yeah. little group, uh, but, you know, talking about in general having all of these Jews flooding out to the wilderness, and to be baptized, and, you know, here confessing their sins, and as an act of repentance, that is quite a spiritual event. It is. It is. Um, could you tell me something about why originally the Jews didn't think that, you know, Jews don't need to be baptized? Yeah, you know, I think it was just simply the, the way that they thought. Someone who's converted, right, someone who comes from the outside, they need a life change. But someone who already believes, somebody who grew up in it, somebody who's already a Jew, I think it also has to do with the fact that the Jews themselves believed that because they were Jews, they already had it. Right. And, and that we'll see that a lot in the interactions with Jesus and the Jews, is the idea that because I'm a Jew, because I'm a son of Abraham, mm -hmm. I, I've arrived. Uh, you know, there, I, there's this theme of spiritual arrogance, is what you're saying. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. There's yeah, yeah, plenty yeah. of that as we, uh, as we read through the Gospels. Yeah. Now verse 6. So John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. Now, I don't want to spend a huge amount of time with this, but generally people get really excited over this verse. I don't know what it is, but... <laughs> he sounds um, like a hippie. Yeah, That's why. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> camel's hair. Um, people are like, oh, it's scratchy. To tell you the truth, camel's hair coats were common coats mm -hmm. in those days. And the underneath hair of the camel was actually very soft. Ah. Um, so the, the idea that it's like this scratchy sackcloth, mm. it's not really true. I think the emphasis of the camel hair and the leather belt is that the students and Elijah himself, when he was uh, a prophet, mm. wore those clothes. It, mm. he, it's a typical clothing of the prophets, and it was meant to signify that I'm in the line of Elijah, I am a prophet. Mm. So uh, John is not shy about announcing who he is. Right. <laughs> I'm here, and I am one of the students, or I'm in the line of the prophets, and I have a message for you. Mm -hmm. And then when we get to the locust and wild honey, oh boy, you know, <laughs> whether it's a carob pod, or whether he actually ate the hippity hoppity bugs, I mean, I looked it up. It was ceremonially clean. It was, and I looked up in the Strong's Concordance, the word, uh -huh. and it says in the definition, hippity hoppity bugs. So, <laughs> You know, people argue about this. It doesn't matter. And the, right. the, the thing is, is that he ate from where he was at. He wasn't going into the, he wasn't going, uh, he wasn't a farmer, and he wasn't going in town to the supermarket. Mm -hmm. He ate what was at hand in the wilderness. And it says something about him and about who he was and what mm -hmm. he was about. Probably says he didn't have a lot of money either. He wasn't setting his plate with fancy Perhaps food. Perhaps he's foraging? He's foraging. He's foraging. Yeah, that makes sense. Great word. Verse 7, what was he saying? And he preached, saying, There comes one after me mm. who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed was baptized, I, I indeed baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Mm. Now, now, here's Mark again, right? Not describing what baptism looks like, you know, he just bows into it and says, The real baptism's coming. I'm John. But it's not really about me. There's this guy who's coming, and mm -hmm. he's going to baptize you, mm -hmm. but he's not going to, he's not concerned with water. Right. He's concerned with baptizing you with the Holy Spirit. Mm. That's kind of, yeah, I, I guess I want to, uh, you know, take, go off on a tangent a little bit and just talk about this, but it excites me a little bit. Right. I don't think we emphasize in our church enough the idea of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Right. I was just talking about this with the youth on Sabbath. We are in the book of Acts this mm -hmm. year, and I asked them, how many of you have been baptized? Most of the hands went up. Did anyone ever tell you about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? 
quite a few fewer hands there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's just a, an idea that's different, and it, it might have something to do, it's our culture, right? Right. It could have something to do with Pentecostals and baptism of the Spirit, and we yeah, don't want to be acquainted with and that. Yeah, scared of that. That's right, yeah. That's weird. I don't want to be in yeah. church rolling down the aisle. Um, Except I, there's another extreme where you go too rational, mm -hmm. too cerebral about it, and you don't leave room for God's divine power to work. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, you know, honestly, you know, I would challenge you as even you're watching this, mm -hmm. am I baptized with the Holy Spirit? Because right. I think John was emphasizing, like, yes, this water baptism is important, but the real baptism's coming. Right. That's Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So... And do I have that baptism? I feel like that's an important question in this yeah. story because John is saying this is important, but there's something even better. Mm -hmm. And if there was a, you know, so here's me being naughty. <laughs> if there was a preference, I would rather be baptized with the Holy Spirit than be baptized with water because mm -hmm. I think the emphasis in the story is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the more important one. Right. Now, it, side, side note, Acts 17 Paul meets a group of people and finds out they were baptized with the baptism of John, mm -hmm. but they didn't even know about Jesus. Right. They had to be rebaptized in water right. because they did not receive the Holy Spirit. They didn't even understand what the Holy Spirit was or who Jesus was. And mm -hmm. Paul rebaptized them in water and they received the Holy right. Spirit. So that says something. That baptism by water, here, here, here's that danger zone, right? It's not enough. We need to be baptized with the Spirit. Well, I'm listening to you, and I'm thinking, baptism by water, the way John was practicing it, was about repentance. And mm -hmm. repentance is an important part of baptism. You know, we, we talk about Absolutely. how you go down into the watery grave, and you leave your old your old mm -hmm. man behind, your old self, using Paul's language here. Mm -hmm. And you, But it sounds like that, what that group of people didn't know was, well then, what happens after you, after you rise up out of that water? They're missing the second half of the story. Absolutely. There's more to it. Yeah. There's much more to it. And I think... If I can say this and be, you know, I, I like stepping on toes. You'll get to know me <laughs> in my sermons. Uh, but I think a lot of us are religious, mm. but not Christian. I mean, I know that sounds strange. Like religious, but not spiritual? The way some other, some postmoderns say I'm spiritual, but not religious? Right, yes. Ah, yeah. Yeah, I, I just think in Seventh-day Adventism, we really emphasize the intellectual knowledge mm -hmm. of the Bible and Christianity, and we emphasize certain truths that we hold in common, mm -hmm. but experientially we lack in the area of being mm -hmm. on fire and full of the Spirit. We right. really, that's just not an area that we, we, yeah. we, uh, we thrive. Anyways, I'm off my soapbox. Let's go to <laughs> verse 9. All right. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So mm. we get right into Jesus being baptized with the Spirit. Right. So after John says, you know, this needs to happen for you, Jesus appears and seems to be the first one. Mm. So he's going to baptize with the Spirit, but he himself is baptized with the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And God confirms, the God the Father is there, confirms it with an audible voice, which I think is pretty amazing. It's amazing. Know. It is pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, if, can I get, recently, there has been this thing that's come back in my circles, I don't mm -hmm. know if your circle's here, but um, the idea that the Spirit isn't a person, that, uh, that Jesus, at some far point in the past, was born out of God, or he wasn't in the beginning, mm -hmm. um, the very beginning, you know, uh, ages past, uh, this idea has come about, and it, and it gives the idea that the Father is the only one who is God, and everybody else is something different, something less than, or a part of. Subordinate. The subordinate. They, they talk to us about it in seminary a lot, because it's a common, it's a common thing that's out there. And, and it goes around Adventism over and over again, even yeah. when I was in college, I heard about it. Let me just say that even in this passage, you have three distinct persons appearing. Right. You have the spirit in the form of a dove, mm -hmm. you have the son who's present there, and then you have the father speaking. Yeah. So it's just one of those things where I like to notice in these moments where all three are present at the same time yes. and different, separate, not 
you know, it, it just is one of those places that you look at and you say, hmm, makes me think. So I want you to think about it. I, I, I think, yeah, this is just in my experience, the temptation to depersonalize the Holy Spirit is because of all the three members of the Godhead, they're like the most alien to us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we, we don't even know what pronoun to use because in the Old Testament, it's she most of the time. In the New, it's he most of the time. The Holy Spirit is just, you know... God the Father has this metaphor of the Father that we can hang our hat on. Jesus, you know, he's, he's an actual historical human being. The Holy Spirit is just harder for us to wrap our heads around because mm -hmm. it, 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 they're so alien to it's us. It's mysterious. <laughs> yeah, it is mysterious. yeah. I mean, we, we, we struggle as humans mm -hmm. with things that don't fit in boxes. There, there is no box for the Holy yeah, Spirit. Yeah, no. Definitely not. That's Absolutely. what's exciting. Um, can, can I also, I, I was reading in uh, our uh, commentary in, I, I was reading in one of our commentaries mm -hmm. that this baptism of the Spirit also um, was the first ordination, or the idea mm -hmm. of ordination. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And, and, you know, I want to bring it up just for a second, not right. to be, not to, you know, go too far into this, mm -hmm. but I noticed a couple things. Number one, mm -hmm. that God chose Jesus to be ordained. And I, and I want to right. emphasize that, that ordination is not chosen by the church. Right. Um, ordination is chosen by God. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as a matter of fact, I, I remember reading an Ellen White quote, I didn't look it up, mm -hmm. but she's very clear that the church's job is to recognize when mm -hmm. God ordains someone. It isn't to actually be the ordinating party, which is a, mm -hmm. a misnomer, a misconception. And here I notice it again, Jesus is ordained by God, Right. And now people will begin to recognize that ordination by seeing God work through him. Right. And I think the church is the same way. We watch those who are preparing for ordination to see, you know, is God working in their life? Do right. the signs, are the signs there that they have mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit and that God has called them? And then if we see those signs, then we lay hands on them. Right. Not to ordain them, but to signify that the church recognizes God's ordination. It's a public sign. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm being bad there. But that's okay. <laughs> Forgive well, me. And, and, and building on that, I find it interesting that this is Jesus' baptism and ordination, which kind of implies that every baptized believer is also ordained into service the day they are baptized. And if that doesn't uh, give you a few shivers and make you think a little bit, I don't know what does. Yeah, I think the giving of the Holy Spirit is to empower them to do the work that God has put right. upon them to do. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, and we don't emphasize that either. No. The sending and the equipping for the work right. of ministry. Yeah. yeah. Verse 12. Immediately, the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was mm -hmm. there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Now, John, uh, Mark, excuse me, Mark doesn't go into a lot of details. Right. We know more from the other Gospels, but Mark's emphasis was not tempted as in like he was drawn to sin or something like that it's more of test he was tested yeah. in the wilderness it was a test by satan and he was with the wild beast and it just gives the idea that you know here's this pure holy one yeah but he's in the midst of this place where he's surrounded by wilderness he's being tested uh by the enemy and then angels are ministering to him also Hi. so you see this great controversy theme oh, really yeah. playing out that there's something mysterious behind the veil that we don't see that's happening mm -hmm. in the life of Jesus from the very beginning. Right. Verse 14. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. So first of all, I think this is interesting because Mark says Jesus was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Well, what was his message? What did Jesus preach? I always wondered, like, what was his regular right. thing that he would say to people? Well, John, John Mark gives us a list. Mark says, number one, he was saying the time is fulfilled. That mm -hmm. is a reference to the 70-week prophecy yes. of Daniel chapter yes. 9, um, emphasizing that the last week has arrived and that uh, the, Jesus is baptized, which is the beginning of the last week. It's the anointing of the Most Holy. Mm -hmm. um, so here is the signifying the event has come, and now right. Jesus can say that time is fulfilled. Right. That prophecy, that specific prophecy about the Most Holy being anointed, that's 
You know, mm -hmm. that's me. I'm baptized. Right. And there's plenty of evidence that that is the ultimate fulfillment. Now, secondly, the kingdom of God is at hand. Mm -hmm. um, God's kingdom is here right now. Why? Because the king of that kingdom is here. Right. You know, he, Jesus, is the head of that kingdom. He has mm -hmm. come down to earth. So that kingdom is here now because he's here. Right. Um, and, and he's emphasizing who he is by saying the kingdom of God is now. Mm -hmm. um, now, here's one of those things. I, I okay. don't want to spend a lot of time with this, okay. but I think another thing that we do as Adventists is we think that the kingdom of God, it will come when Jesus comes. Mm. But I, I think that the kingdom of God is here wherever we are. Mm. I think the kingdom of God is in this place as the people of God gather, and as we go out, the kingdom of God mm -hmm. goes with us. I, it's, a, it's a difference in thinking, but I just think a lot of times we're like, oh, when Jesus comes, mm -hmm. you know, then the kingdom will... But, right. you know, we are the kingdom of God because we're the servants of the king. We, we are the messengers of the king. We are the... We're the body of Christ. And right. so we're the representatives of this kingdom. Um, I just think that, I don't know. It's like, it's like the kingdom doesn't quite rule yet, because clearly there's a lot wrong with our world. There is a lot wrong with our world. Yes. But it's breaking through. It's breaking through <laughs> where we let it break through. The kingdom yeah. The kingdom is is present in those who allow Jesus to work in their hearts. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And uh, the last thing, what's the response to the prophecy being fulfilled and the kingdom of God being present in the king? Repent and believe the gospel. Um, it, what is our response? Repent is just a U-turn. It means to turn in a different direction, to get away. Repentance is mm -hmm. turning from one direction and going in a different direction. So right. it's a very similar message that John the Baptist was giving. Jesus yeah. is continuing the idea of repentance. Uh, and, and his disciples baptized mm -hmm. by water too. So repentance is still an emphasis. But now there's this other element. And that is to believe the good news, yeah. to believe this message that is coming, to believe in Jesus, mm. and uh, and it, this this faith aspect mm -hmm. now enters in because up to this right. point, you, you, you're not seeing that faith aspect, but here's the first moment it appears, and it appears in the preaching of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus is teaching repentance and faith. Right. Well, that's it. That's it for our first section, um, verses uh, 1 through 15. We invite you to respond. If you have questions, uh, you'd like to uh, reach out to us, uh, james.oconnor, O-C-O-N-N-O-R, at sccsda.org is my email. I invite you to, to reach out to me and email me if you have a question. I'd love to, love to answer maybe uh, a question or two if we if we get them, but uh, right. thank you so much for watching, and would you close in prayer for us, Jen? Absolutely. Precious Lord, thank you so much for the gift of this gospel, this, this early gospel, this action gospel, and for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lord mm -hmm. God, let us not be merely heads of faith. Let us not merely be full of ideas and thoughts. Lord, let your spirit transform our hearts and translate into action. Mm -hmm. Let us believe in a gospel with legs. Lord God, we thank you so much for the gift of your precious son, Jesus. May our hearts cling to him always. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.